If you're not familiar with the Galveston Bay Estuary Program, they are actually responsible for the health of Galveston Bay. They're, they're one of these 28 programs around the nation, and they bring together dozens of scientists, nonprofits, stakeholders like you to help kind of guide and uh, lead in terms of how we can improve and maintain the health of Galveston Bay. And so Galveston Bay Estuary Program, what we call GIBEP, is, is largely responsible for a lot of the work that you're gonna see here today. So I wanted to show you this map. So here's Spring Creek, this is us. And you can see here all the waterways that drain to the bay and the watershed that we're in right now is one of those watersheds that drain to the bay. Here's Lake Conroe, here's Lake Houston and the San Jacinto River comes down here. Watershed activity is critical to the estuary health. And I talked about that a little bit more uh, in the beginning, but how so? A big part of that is habitat protection. And I talked about that in the beginning a little bit too. You've got healthy watersheds. They can provide habitats, breeding grounds. Um, I'm sure, as a matter of fact, I heard you guys, I heard you guys heard from um, someone from Audubon at your last talk. So you understand the importance of birds. Probably a lot of you are birders. We have some amazing migration trails in Texas. And a lot of that is supported by some of these um, watershed activities. Some of the near shore uh, wetlands and migration routes are really important to keep up those species. Watersheds are also important for nutrient health because a lot of the overflow and runoff that you get into your waterways and into your bays bring a lot of those nutrients that are, that are essential to support estuarine life. Water quality is a very big deal for water activity. So if you have a lot of runoff that's carrying pesticides or heavy metals or chemicals, that's going to go down into your estuarine environment. Sediment regulation. So again, if you have, if you have excessive erosion, that's going to be a big deal later on down the road. Um, also, well-maintained watersheds help with flood mitigation. They can absorb some of the water. They can slow down the flow. It means it's not coming all down at once into the bay. Um, biodiversity and resilience is something I mentioned. You can support a whole variety of species. You're not working on that monoculture. You're really helping all the species to thrive and live together in that ecosystem. So all of that to say, what we do on the watershed, those activities on the watershed are really, really important for the estuarine health. So let's switch gears a little bit and then talk about coastal resilience. And this definition at the top is kind of today's definition of coastal resilience. The ability of our coastal economic, social, and ecological systems to withstand change and quickly recover from disaster. So when we talk about building coastal resilience, it's about building our systems to be able to bounce back from these big disturbances. And that might be something, what we call kind of the quick flash, like these storms, the hurricanes, floods, or the slow burns, like the droughts. Either way, that, that is system perturbation. And what we want is for that system to be able to bounce back. Um, so what we're gonna focus on tonight is the Galveston Bay Estuary Resilience Action Plan. I'm gonna come back to this if we have time because I know we started a little bit late. So let's move ahead. Um, so this was stakeholders for, from the Galveston Bay Estuary Program. This is a series of experts that are focused on um, the bay and its watershed. And they came together and worked on this resilience plan. And they developed a set of stressors that Galveston Bay will be facing now and in the future. And these stressors, I think probably will look very familiar to you. These are stressors that are, they're climate stressors. Um, some of them are also kind of population stressors and it's stressors that a lot of our ecosystems are facing now and in the future. So the, there were 11 stressors and these were changes to land use in the built environment. So this was more focused on infrastructure. So in fact, I'm gonna skip ahead because I wanna talk about each one individually just a little bit. 
In, so there were increasing extreme events. This was coastal flooding and storm surge. Now they actually identified uh, flooding as three different types, chronic higher tides. So this, these are things like that nuisance flooding, they call it sunny day flooding, but that is when you get this kind of combination of both the sea level rise um, and then um, water events or rain events kind of out further out. And you might just get that, that daily flooding in areas where you didn't used to get it. Then increasing extreme events, this is the storm surge flooding. These are, this is something we're all familiar with um, and it's, it's gonna be those really big flood events. And then increased inland flooding, this is more of your Harvey type flooding where you get those big rainy events and then you have the freshwater flooding. This is separate from that nuisance flooding and storm surge. Increasing drought, ocean acidification. Um, so this is something that is actually kind of an unknown right now for Galveston Bay. A lot of estuaries are facing the issue of becoming more acidic um, and some of the oceans are too. So it's important for us to know what Galveston Bay is in that. There are things you can actually do to help buffer that if it's occurring. So it's important to know it so you can have a plan in place. They also selected changes to land use in the built environment. So they had two here again that were slightly related. One was population increase. One was changes to land use. This was more about infrastructure and those land use changes. Population increase, they were talking about increasing number of permanent residents as well as tourists. Sea level rise and subsidence. So this is, sea level rise is what we're all familiar with. Um, subsidence is actually, it can be caused by pumping. Um, it can be about the volume of the ocean. Uh, our area of Galveston Bay is some of the worst sea level rise in the nation. Um, it is a, it's something that we are really gonna have to face and think about how we can plan for. Then these last three are related again, just slightly nuanced different, warmer summers. So this is increase in, in daily high air temperatures and average temperatures. So this is about habitats and kind of the critters being able to withstand that long-term change in uh, temperatures over the whole summer. Warmer waters, so this is temperature of the water itself, and this is more about daily temperature. Um, some, of the, some of the species can be very, very susceptible to some of those daily changes, and we're seeing a lot more of those. So it's about when those are gonna come and, and how we prepare for it. And then warmer winters, this is a bigger deal because of certain plant life invasives, for example, are gonna find it easier to spread if we keep having warmer winters if we don't have those cold snaps to kind of shut down that spread. So these were the stressors that they identified that Galveston Bay is gonna be facing now in the future. Now, this is a lot of words, but I kind of wanted to take you through what's involved or what was involved in this. This is a, a very similar type of thing when you start talking risk. For every single one of those stressors, so for example, here you see warmer summers, um, the work group came up with a series of risks. So for example, if you have a warmer, hotter summer, people might be using more water for irrigation leading to increased runoff. Um, the second one, warmer summers will lead to warmer water. Warmer water means more growth opportunities for fecal bacteria, which means there's gonna be more bacteria and exceeding the, the water quality uh, limits. So, we, they're, they're, the group came up with hundreds of these um, risks associated with each stressor and then went through a series of evaluating each one of those. So what's the consequence? So for the stressor, what is the impact of the risk? In, in this case, increased runoff um, on Galveston Bay plans goal of priority. So this priority, for example, is reducing non-point source pollution. So if it's a low risk, the goal is not impacted. It's not as important as other things. Medium, your status quo is going to change. The goal is going to be more difficult to reach, but you can get there. High means that goal is out of reach. It's a major disruption to the system. And then the probability for the stressor, what is the likelihood of the risk increase or occurring? So not the stressor, but the actual risk. So if we're actually going to have warmer summers, how likely do we think it is that we're going to have increased runoff occurring? So for every one of these stressors then, they evaluated that consequence and the probability um, on a low, medium, high scale. And then taking those, we came up with these matrices. Again, it's a lot of words, 
the important thing to note here is that for each matrix, matrix, excuse me, in this upper right, we have a whole series of high consequence and high probability risks. These are the, the risks that Galveston Bay Estuary Program is gonna have to plan for now and in the future. So septic systems are gonna fail. Uh, with increased extreme event flooding, we're certainly gonna see new sources of pollution and those could be a high consequence. Um, increasing drought means increased water usage. So using these matrices, they were able then, and again, just note to determine, this is about 25 risks. So of those 300, they were able to narrow down, here's our high consequence and high probability risks. These are the ones we need to plan for. These are the ones that are likely to happen and they're gonna have the biggest consequence if they do happen. So, you know, they started at this very granular, granular level, but they were able to take it through a series of exercises to bring about those 25 risks they really knew they needed to plan for. And so for each one of those, then they went through this exercise of the risk management approach. Are they gonna to try to mitigate it? Is there any action they can take to either lower the consequence or the likelihood of the risk? Is it something that can be transferred? So Galveston Bay Estuary Program or one of their partners, can they accept it right now? So you're just gonna to have to run the risk because maybe you don't have any, you can't take any actions to lower the consequence. You're gonna to have to accept that that consequence may occur. Or can you take some kind of action so that you won't be exposed to the risk? Using that then, they were able to come up with a series of adaptation actions that could mitigate that risk by bringing either the consequence or probability down to a medium or a low. And so using that, they went through those risks. And I'm gonna show you this one as an example. And actually it's, it, the reason I chose this one is because it um, has to do with some of the watershed protection planning. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Spring Creek Watershed Protection Plan. If you're not, you should definitely check it out. If you're a member of Woodland Screen, I think you'd find it very interesting. These are watershed protection plans are kind of the carrot approach EPA for a long time with water quality was using more of a stick approach with total maximum daily loads where you'd get a fine maybe if your water quality wasn't so great. Watershed protection plans are voluntary. They're stakeholder led. Um, it's about all the things a group of stakeholders can do to improve water quality in their own watershed. And Spring Creek is working their way through one now. And watershed protection plans are very important to Galveston Bay Estuary Program, to the watershed around it. Uh, in our area, both TCQ and Texas State and Soil Water Conservation Board support watershed protection plans with funding from the EPA. And we actually have a lot around the Houston region. Um, a lot have been developed in the last 10 years. It's phenomenal, really. Um, so if you if you haven't been involved in your Spring Creek WPP, I encourage you to look it up. Um, HGAC is running that, and there's um, stakeholder meetings going on currently, I think. So, okay, so let's go back. So here's what here's kind of where we started. The Give Back Plan goal. Um, this one was ensure safe human and aquatic usage, uh, reduce risk through water to protection plans. Okay, so, so the risk that was identified was that bacteria in floodwaters, high consequence, high probability. So the choice was to do some adaptation actions. And so in this case, I'm just showing a couple of examples that partners do. So University of Houston Clear Lake, um, they're actually, right now they have a project using genetic methods to track pathogen sources in watersheds. HGAC is developing or implementing these watershed protection plans. And USGA, USGS, excuse me, is doing some wet water monitoring for the city of Houston to look at how different rain events and different, um, what they call low impact development uh, or green infrastructure types of adaptation activities impact bacteria in the watershed. So this whole, whole kind of section then can be wrapped up into this grouping of implementation of WPPs as a big impact to mitigate the consequence of uh, bacteria and flood or waters. So the groupings that they ended up with to help mitigate some of these risks or consequences was stakeholder outreach and education, 
stakeholder outreach alerts and risks. So what's the difference? Education is much like it sounds. Uh, stakeholder workshops, talking about these, what can people do, what actions can they take. Alerts and risks is different. It's, it's about how you communicate um, risk to stakeholders. So sometimes that can be something as, as simple, as, or it's, I guess it's not simple, but something like a flood alert system. Um, it can also be uh, communicating a lot of the um, uh, high waters, or even um, if you've seen the bacteria risk alerts along the beach watch. So it can encompass all of those things. Monitoring was another big groupie. Um, this, this can be for things we don't know, uh, like the calcification in Galveston Bay. It can be for things that we need to keep an eye on because we're afraid it's going to change, like the bacteria levels in the watershed. Implementation of um, watershed protection plans, and then preservation, conservation, restoration, much like it sounds. I'm sure you're familiar with this, but how we can preserve our lands and waters and habitats because those green infrastructures are so important um, in, in adaptation actions for a lot of these risks and stressors. Research, if we don't know enough information, how can we get our answers? Promote water conservation and reuse and promote native habitat. So in the, in the plan, we kind of ended up with this, this table that showed the stressors and risks so for example, here we have nuisance flooding, sea level rise and subsidence, and extreme event flooding. All of these had, a, had the same identified risk of increased flooding of property and habitat. And the potential adaptation strategy groupings that were under there were stakeholder outreach education and monitoring. Can that action reduce the likelihood of the risk? Well, stakeholder education, no, it, because there's not a lot that you can educate to uh, reduce the likelihood of increased flooding. But could the action reduce the consequence of the risk? Yes, because through stakeholder education, you can talk about things like green infrastructure, you can talk about things like sea level rise, you can talk about things that you can do to help reduce the consequence of the action. Um, and these were just some selected examples. The group actually had um, a whole list of adaptation mitigation ag actions for each one of these categories. So through, through this, we went through each of those stressors that we identified in the beginning. We grouped the risks that were the same for each stressor, which were several. And then each one of those had an identified adaptation or mitigation action. And then it was identified whether or not that could reduce the likelihood of the risk or the consequence of the risk. So if we come back here, then we can see again these adaptation groupings and how each one of those will impact the various stressors. So what I wanted to talk, that's a brief overview of the plan, um, but I did want to talk a little bit about kind of what it means for you. What does this mean for me? Um, there are a lot of opportunities within here that we can do here in our watershed to impact the health of Galveston Bay. I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I'm, I'm going to switch out here. I've got um, I've got something else I want to show you guys, and it should be pulled up. I'll switch over there, and then I'll come back because I wanted to show some of these climate data, which are some of the climate data that um, the group was looking at when we were looking at these stressors. Could someone give me a thumbs up or a yes if you can see the social vulnerabilities and climate screen? Yeah, thank you, thank you, okay. Um, so what we have here is a series of climate data. I'll pull this down a little bit. This was um, another project that we worked on and this was using statistically downscaled data that we got from um, Drs. Catherine Hale and Dr. Ann Stoner. And we put it into this, what we call the Resilient Science Information Network. In the background, you're gonna see this blue layer change. This is projected days above 100. So this is the total number of annual days over 100 as compared to today. So here's our scale. So this red area is showing 
um, that by 2100, I stopped this on 2100, we are going to see more than 70 annual days over 100 than where we are today. You, you can see throughout the watershed, it's, it's not as dire, kind of further coastal. We've got 30 to 50 extra days above 100. That is still a lot, and that's a lot for habitat. It's a lot for the whole watershed, which as we know, those activities on the watershed are going to impact the bay. So if we're looking at that kind of extreme heat, it is, it's a very big deal uh, for the critters that live on the land. It's a big deal for the critters that live in the water. And we have to think about how we can take action, adaptation action to help mitigate some of those consequences. Now, one thing that's important for planners when they're looking at this, um, the other thing that we have here, this purple, is called CDC Social Vulnerability Index. And so it is showing the purple dots, um, the areas that are higher on that social vulnerability index. So they it may be higher because the, the data that go into creating that index are things like income, um, health, if there's a driver in the household, um, members of the household that are over 80, um, people of color, uh, health issues. So there's a lot that goes into that social vulnerability index. But you can see right away some of the areas that show up higher on that that are also in these higher areas for the days above 100. So that lets people able to kind of focus and say, all right, this is where we really need to think about pooling centers, or this is where we need to think about where some of those um, drought areas may be happening, which is going to increase runoff to the to the bay when we have that first flush of storms. So the climate data is important, not just for establishing those stressors, but also helping to plan those adaptation actions. I want to show you one more thing on here. So sorry if I'm making everyone dizzy. I know it's a lot of back and forth there on this. I'm going to pull up severe repetitive flooding properties. I'm going to turn off days above 100. And I'm going to turn on the three-day highest rainfall. I'll turn on the timer again. And I'll let it go through here. So this three-day highest rainfall, that is in inches, the projected amount of rain that the area would get in three days. So these are those really big flashy storms. The pink area is greater than nine inches. This is projected out 2080. Um, and this, these bluish areas are seven to eight. Now, what I've overlain this time is the severe repetitive flooding properties. Now, I like to tell people that that data is only as good as what went in there. This is not windshield data. This is FEMA's data. So this is people, only the people that had flood insurance in the first place, only the people that reported a loss, um, and only the people that then um, got money for that loss. So it was actually gauged as a loss. So it's clearly not everyone that has severe repetitive flooding property loss, but these are the ones that are documented. So it's it's the best gauge we've got to kind of go on. But you can see in our watershed, like down here, some of those areas that are so high on that three, three day highest rainfall above nine inches are also the ones with that severe repetitive flooding loss. So those are things that we need to think about, again, when it comes to the bay and what that flooding is going to mean for watershed health, for communities. Um, all of that is important for the resilience of the bay. So I just wanted to, to take a minute to show you that so you can kind of get the idea of the considerations, as I said, not just for the stressors, but some of the conversation that goes into those adaptation actions, too. And I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up there because I know we started a little bit late and I see some questions in the chat. So, um, Paul, do you want to take that or you want me just to start reading through the questions? Um, well, I took some notes. I think, again, if you want to do the, if you put it in chat for me, I said I'd rather not try to open it up for discussion because we could be here all night. So you have to earn your question. I wanted to, to just mention that 
um, as someone stated, there's a whole lot of information here. And I've even looked at the study. There's a lot of data and a lot of information and a, and a lot of issues. So this will be on our website. You can go back and, and uh, review it at your leisure. I think uh, most of it will be. We got a little late start on the recording and we'll make sure that people understand that there's a, a little gap, but most of the information is there. The other thing I wanted to, to mention that one of the questions was about pet waste. Uh, and to, to bring that into, you know, also the watershed protection plan that HGAC has done with everybody's help, but that we've had people come to talk to us about that. And so again, it shows that Spring Creek and the woodlands has a lot to do with what ends up in Galveston Bay, including dog waste and everything associated with that. And I think that's interesting after so many years that we can now do genetic testing to prove that it's not really ducks or hogs, or at least maybe we prove that some of it is. So it's a little bit easier yeah. to then, uh, you know, be able to discern because there's been a lot of discussion about whether it's human or not. Uh, mainly right. we just know that our bodies of water are not swimmable yep. and uh, that it all ends up in Galveston Bay. Also, I was talking about the population, uh, you know, for many, many years, we've worried about the, the amount of fresh water that gets to the bay, <laughs> excuse me, and realizing that a lot of it stops at Livingston Dam and, uh, and that a lot of that is the water that comes from wastewater treatment plants, et cetera, from uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And they've been busy doing their best to reuse that water, clean it up a little bit and pump it back up to Dallas-Fort Worth. And I think that's one of the things that y'all could um, assure you, you uh, did look at those reuse numbers and like you said, the more the population grows up in the upper reaches, the more that's going to cause them to try to find sources, including reuse and taking water that might not. Uh, and a lot of that has, again, all this kind of leads us to the fact that these things are not just, I guess what I'm saying is the lack of water going down to the bay we know has a tremendous impact on oysters and flounder. And, you know, we just closed the flounder season. I think now for the first time, you can now have one flounder because wow. of the lack of, that. yeah, but that just came out and I don't know what we're going to do about things like that because again, that's been an, a discussion for many years. So that's one of the things that population change. Um, someone also asked, I think it was whether the, when you mentioned the sea rise, which is pretty significant in Galveston, mm -hmm. they have a monitor down by the, by the channel, but it was um, whether or not it was, we have the highest sea rise or the highest subsidence mm. or is it a combination i guess it is a combination um it's sea level rise is, is both it's it's called estuary i don't know they could have come up with a better name but it's that combination of sea level rise and subsidence and so um texas yeah, of course it does have an issue with subsidence or it did um, which, you know, is not something you can ever undo. Once it's done, it's done. So that problem still perpetuates through till now. Uh, and uh, Rockport and Galveston both have um, uh, monitors. And it, it's actually, um, and if I can find it, Paul, I'll send it to you so you can send out to the group. The, the IPCs, uh, IPCC are, is the Intergovernment Committee that does a lot of the uh, climate modeling and the climate reports. Their latest report had a graph 
that show the monitors around the nation and you can see where Galveston and Rockport kind of stand out and it's it's in their overview but I'll make a note and if I can find it I'll send it out because I think y'all would be interested in it. Okay. Um, I did want to talk about the dog poop. <laughs> very real thing, very real problem. A lot of the urban watersheds and in these watershed protection plans, it does tend to be a large part of the contribution to the bacteria in the waterways. And a lot of them are setting up mitigation actions to try and work with the dog owners to improve that situation. So, you know, the bacteria, it's any warm blooded mammal. Um, in some of the urban ones, feral hogs are a big problem. And as Paul said, that bacteria testing, it's actually fascinating how that can be done. It's becoming a bigger deal, especially in the last five years. When, when you first start out doing something like that, it's, it's called BST, bacteria source tracking. And you actually have to make a background library of all the DNAs. So before you can even start, you have to go around to your monitoring points all in this, in our case, say all around the bay, you have to get known quantities of say the dog poop or the feral dog poop. You have to type that, you have to get a match. And now you have kind of that known DNA, then you can start your monitoring. So it's actually, it started for us as a several year process. Now we've got a pretty robust library and, um, Oh my gosh, it's Dr. Oh, he's on the tip of my tongue and I'll think of it. He's out of A&M um, and he's been doing a lot of the BST work and he's published a couple of papers on the work around the Bay. And so we can actually see some, um, we Harkley do a lot of work over in Double Bayou. We've had some results over there. Um, there's been some in some of the urban watersheds on the Western side of the Bay. And so you can kind of see where some of these are starting to fall out um, in terms of human, dog, wild animals, um, somewhat avian. Avian's a little bit harder to type, but it's it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so much of this is. I think um, I had a comment about the... I want you to talk a little bit about, about the Ike Dyke Speaking of right universe, but, but let me before you do that, I wanted that there's been a comment on the chat about the basically the overwhelming of wastewater treatment plants by floodwaters, and uh, and of course in the last thirty years, the uh, TCQ has made a lot of changes because it was natural for a developer to put the wastewater plant down by the water, yep. and. You couldn't build houses there in reality, so you just put it in the floodplain. Right. And that's kind of stopped. You now have to elevate those tanks, but there's a whole lot of tanks that can't be elevated. So we do get in an you know inundation from from those uh, floodwaters. Yep. But yes. if, and then we have overflowing pipes. We have <clears throat> backed up pump station. Excuse me. And so right. there's a lot of that leads to the E. coli, et cetera, from, again, I just said, I don't know that we're, if it's the sole problem or not, and DNA will certainly fix that question. But I think that's another issue that, that we as citizens have to demand that we have a system that's tight yeah. And that we, do, you know, that's something that we in the woodlands want to do here is make sure that we have a, a tip top sanitary sewer system and a treatment plant that's safe from it. You know, and you're never going to do the Harvey. It's, it's going to, it's going to come over the top on some cases, but we yes, are trying yes. to mitigate that. Well, part of the watershed protection plan, they'll do monitoring what they call routine and then event. So they'll go out and monitor during, you know, just kind of standard daily type of conditions but they will do targeted monitoring during storm events. And that will help get closer maybe to some of the answers for the treatment plants, because right. that should be those overflow situations. Um, but don't forget your septic tanks because those can also, yeah, that can be a real issue as well. Um, and so that, you know, both, both of those can be problematic in the watershed. Yeah, I think, well, I won't go into my pet peeves, but the, 
construction of so many subdivisions that have septic tanks or so-called aerobic plants now, but that's a huge problem. And believe it or not, we have them in Houston. I mean, uh, areas that yeah. are within the city limits now where they had uh, concentrations of septic tanks. And the problem with those, they work just fine as long as everybody pays attention. But then people get lazy and forget about it or they break and they just start to pollute. So that's a big issue with HGAC too. They track. Yep. all those permitted septic tanks. So we're watching, but hopefully that we can change that to where people have a more concentrated and uh, coordinated treatment. So let's go to, Ike, say what you tell me about Ike Dyke. Well, I think it's very expensive. That's what I think. <laughs> and I, the original plan that AC, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, put out, um, they did um, get a lot of stakeholder feedback on that, and they they worked that into their plan. Uh, I, I think that there still will need to be and will be uh, environmental assessments that that should be done. Uh, before any kind of construction takes place. There, there has been some initial environmental assessment studies, but of course the biggest concern is on flows, um, depending on how the gates are put in and how they're um, anchored at the bottom and what the method is for, for closing and then opening. Uh, in turn, in turn, and I'm speaking strictly in terms of environmental concerns. So, what that might mean for for flows within the bay, and how quickly um, it might recover post post opening, and then of course there's the you know construction itself, which is no small thing, and its impact on the bay. So, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think it's um, there's going to be a lot of studies between now and when it will get off the ground. Yeah, that's, I think that goes back to the freshwater inflows question too, for me. Yes. That's something we worry about getting too salty or not salty enough. And, yep. and a lot of it depends on releases of water. And so it, to me, it's, you got to get the salt water into the bay at the right yep. time. You got to get it out with the fresh water. And well, with, we talked with, about how, you know, it's a dynamic estuary and the species depend on those changes and they can't have too much of one or the other. You know, when we had Harvey, we had tremendous amount of inflows all at once into the bay. And boy, that knocked our oysters, our oyster population just, just, Peter right. after that they just it just wiped them out and it took a while for them to recover I mean really they're still recovering so um you know even then and actually um pH went up a lot uh right the three weeks after that it pH went up a lot after all that runoff so you know it's just it's it's something like that that can once the system turns it it kind of you know it's it it kind of takes a little bit for it to get back to where it was. So you that's why it's important to kind of understand the impacts of some of those things. Yeah, and I and mean, we can't blame. That's the other thing we've done recently is the TCQ has closed a whole lot of Galveston Bay oyster reefs to any kind of fishing at all, and and that as a result, like you said, when when they got wiped out and then they kind of came back, but you, you know, it's going to take a long time to get back to that point. And that, that's a lot of the people don't think about the economic factor of the Bay. How, how many billions of dollars around it. Um, on the Ike Dike too, it's like when, if you're trying to get the salt water in and out, um, you know, it's not going to hurt or help to have a big fence across there, you know, a, a gate to, to get it through that channel 
it seems like it just disrupts the natural flow of water. But um, I think the, also the it seems the Ike Dyke. It's we remember. <clears throat> excuse me. One of our our uh, audience here reminded us that you know when when Harvey was here, we couldn't get the water out fast enough. It backed up all the way to the woodlands. Yeah. The whole system backed up, and and what would it help to have a wall there? So, in other words, they think it keeps the water out, but in some cases, we've had to try to get the water away. And, and that would be a big decision, right? I mean, if it's if it's not a storm surge, in theory, they wouldn't close the gates. But someone has to make that call, and you got to make it based on models and the storm that's coming in. So you you've got to know, and and for the most part, with storm surge, you would know. But storms are spinning up so much faster these days. I mean, look at what we had this past season. That, that was crazy. So you know, to to sort of be able to model some of those when they're not acting like the old storms are, it it makes it tough. You know, Paul. Um, I don't know if they would, but it might be worthwhile for your group reaching out to someone from ACE and seeing if they wouldn't give you all a, a, a presentation on the Ike Dyke. To reach out with HGAC? Um, um, Army Corps of Engineers. Oh, I'm saying the Corps. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm, uh, I think we need to do that. I, I guess I was surprised just when it came up, it kind of felt like an idea that needed a whole lot of study and before yeah. Long, we had Congress all for it and all our senators and everybody jumping on board. And, yeah. And haven't really thought about those environmental issues. Like you said, hopefully that'll that'll work. I I hope so. I, I would think so. The commenter says that with the gates open, flow in and out of the bay is reduced by around 10%. So and I don't know the answer to that, but that was something yeah. that I heard too, that there was. I, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. So I thank you so much. You oh, know, yeah, I, I appreciate you hanging with me at, <laughs> earlier and that no and problem. everybody. Well, thanks for the time. I really appreciate all the great questions. So thanks. Right. You guys. And I think I'll tell you, this one is by Terry MacArthur, who says always such a terrific learning experience when you present. Thank you for sharing your vast knowledge, Stephanie. Oh, thank you, Terry. I appreciate so, uh, that. Terry's, of course, the president of the Woodlands Green and busy, busy, busy uh, with water quality issues and trying to teach folks about the Clean Rivers Act and also yeah. having a, a lot of student involvement, youth involvement. And as we all know, that's where the answer lies. If we can't get the kids educated, then it'll come to a stop. 100% agree. <laughs> so I thank you again. Appreciate you coming. I said I appreciate you and what heart the work they do. Uh, we appreciate you. And I encourage people to go to HARC's website. There's a lot of, I mean, as you can see, uh, Stephanie's a good example of the quality of folks that work there, and we appreciate that. And I also encourage you to go to Woodlands Green website. There's, uh, I say it every time, but we do a lot of stuff, and mm -hmm. I think there's something in our group. Somebody's interested, and they'll be glad to join you and let you join them and get any things done, uh, including the removal of invasive species. So, yeah. So we do that and we sell rain barrels uh, and a lot of good work. And part of it is this um, trying to help educate the public in matters like this. So you've done a fine job of that tonight. And I appreciate that. So I'm going to somebody turn off the recorder and uh I'm going to say good night and thanks again for, for coming.